Thursday night we had a, another great trunk or treat. Uh, we had over 250 kids that came through and somewhere between 500 and 600 total uh, came through our building and uh, on both sides of the street we had, we had people doing all kinds of things in church. That's, that's you. You did it again and I commend you and applaud you. Um, it is amazing what, what you and we accomplish when we come together. Uh, and so I, I know I saw a number of people come through that I recognize, and, and I know you did too, and that gave us an opportunity to, to have a connection with those people and, and a reminder we're here and we're open and, uh, and we're inviting and we're reaching out. And so be praying about the seeds that were planted through that event Thursday night. Um, I have for uh, the longest time felt like that I was a devoted Sooner fan uh, because uh, because I, I follow them and uh, I watch all the games and I uh, read about how the team is doing and it, during the off season I keep up with them, what's going on and um, I, I've, I have been that way since a young age. I remember about probably 10, 12 years old uh, when there were a lot of basketball games that were not on TV. And I remember listening by myself to a radio, Wayman Tisdale, Tim McAllister, those guys and, and, and the basketball games and following it. So I've considered myself a devoted Sooner fan. However, that's not true because... Devoted fans are the ones with season tickets. <laughs> They're the ones that pony up for season tickets. They're the ones that when it is 100 degrees outside, they're in the stadium sweating themselves to death. Uh, they're the ones that when it is freezing outside and snowing, they're at the game. Right? That's the, that's the devoted fans. Uh, I'm still a fan. That's okay. But not... Not in the true sense of the word devoted. Look at this. Uh, we're going to talk today about being disciples. And in Acts 2 verse 41, this is where the church begins in Acts chapter 2. And uh, look down in verse 41 and notice something about the disciples, the followers of Christ in the church's infancy. It says, those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayers they devoted themselves if you know what it looks like to see a devoted football fan tailgating at the games rain or shine right there are people that travel out of state every home game uh, to go and and watch and cheer on if we know what that looks like in a football setting we can imagine what that looks like in a spiritual setting, right? And that's what these Christians were. They were devoted. If I, if I were to ask uh, you the question, what is the most important thing in your life? And being in a church building, you might think, well, you know, God, preacher, God, I'm pretty sure that's the right answer. God is the most important thing in my life. And we might answer that, and we might think that, and we might mark that if we were filling out a quiz, what's the most important thing in your life? God is. And, and along with God comes His church. But ask yourself a few questions such as, does my, you know, there's ways to evaluate it, am I really being honest? Does my time reflect that God is the most important thing in my life? Does the way I handle my money reflect that God is the most important thing in my life? Uh, does, the, does my speech reflect that? Does the way I live reflect that God is the most important thing in my life? And today's sermon is a reminder that God is calling us to be followers of Christ. He's calling us not to just be members of, a, of an organization, but to be fully devoted disciples. That's today's sermon. And so I encourage you throughout this sermon to you evaluate you. That's what today is about. Uh, there was a man that approached Jesus. Turn to Mark chapter 10. There was a man that came up to Jesus and it says he ran up to him and he knelt before him and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we would say, it, it, just if that's all we knew about this man, uh, I would speculate that this man is a spiritual man. 
He's spiritually minded. He's passionate. He runs to Jesus. He's humble. He kneels before Jesus. He seems to be genuine. What must I do? I, I want to inherit eternal life. And Jesus, verse 19, starts talking, and Jesus starts naming commandments. You know the commandments. He's a fellow Jew. He says, uh, the commandments don't, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, on and on. And verse 21, then Jesus says, because, because the man answers that question about the commandments, the man says, I've kept those since I was, since I was youth. Uh, but, however, Jesus only listed six of the commandments. And, and maybe he did that on purpose because here's what Jesus said next. He, he, he looked, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing. And at that point, Jesus gives him a test. You lack one thing. Here's the test. It's a pass-fail. Simple test. Sell everything you have. Give to the poor. Follow me. This man went away sorrowful because he, he failed that test. He's, he's not going to pass that test. And it seems that he knew he wouldn't pass that test as soon as that was asked of him. He, he can't do that. And, and I would ask that you ask yourself, what question might Jesus ask you? If you imagine you being that man and you approach Jesus, say, Jesus, I want to go to heaven. What must I do? And Jesus says, well, you know the Christian life and walking in the light. And, and, and we say, okay, I'm doing that. And Jesus says, but there's, there's one thing. Let me ask you. What would it be for you? What's the one thing that the devil has you stumbling upon what's the one thing it could be it could be like this man it could be money it could be things it could be and i would have you consider if you think of it in a money sense in other words jesus didn't call everyone to sell everything they had why did he ask that man that i think he asked that man to sell all he had to test him to say who does your who does your wealth belong to that's the same question. He could have asked this man, who does your money belong to? And that man's honest answer would be, that's my money. And Jesus says, wrong answer. You're not a, you're not a devoted disciple. You're lacking. What is it that I have that is mine, that I consider mine? It may be a relationship I'm in that is not right and I need to make it right. It may be my time. God, I will give you one hour Sunday morning. I'll give it to you. I can't do two. By the way, I missed an opportunity, church, today, and, and God help me, if I remember this next year, we're going to capitalize on it. Today is the day to start coming to Sunday school Sunday mornings. Today is the day, right? The fallback day. If you have trouble getting here at 930 and you're like, I don't know why, you know, I can get to work on time, just can't get to church at 930 to come to class, today was your day. And we'll have another one next year. Isn't that something? But we, you may say, well, God, I'll give you an hour. I, I don't know about two. I don't know about, you know, the small group deal that's going on. And I don't know if, you know, if I can always, I, I don't know about Wednesday night. I mean, my Wednesday, you know, I come home from work. I mean, so it could be time. What is it for you? Jesus looked around. Look at what he said. He said to his disciples how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. That church has always been a troubling Scripture for me. I, I, I think I understand it in a way, but Jesus talks so strongly about it. If Jesus had said, you know what, it is a little, it is a little harder the more money you have, I could, that makes perfect sense to me. But Jesus talks very strongly about this. The disciples, they were amazed. They didn't understand it. Uh, he said to them, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, don't forget, just because you know someone richer than you doesn't mean you're not rich. And as God looks at us, and here's what troubles me, as God looks at this world, all of us in this room, maybe, maybe a handful of exceptions, all of us in this room are wealthy in the world's wealth. So now... Read that again, how difficult. And Jesus doesn't go into detail explaining, but maybe it's because 
to enter heaven, God has to be number one. And when the more money you have, the more difficulty it is to keep God number one. Maybe it is the fact that wealth tends to make one prideful. Maybe wealth and greed tend to go hand in hand. Maybe wealthy people are tempted to trust in their money. Nevertheless, I, I remind you, a spiritual mind says, you know what, if I get a, a big raise this next year, I need to watch out. If my income increases, I need to watch out. If I go to school and get a degree and get a job and make more money than I've ever made, I need to watch out. Because money can be something that becomes a god to us and a stumbling block. This man's money was his money. It wasn't God's money. And so Peter, verse 28, Peter runs to Jesus and he says, Jesus, look, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus answers him and says, he commends him and says, You're, you will be blessed back in this life. And he may not mean, he talks about houses and brothers and sisters and, or uh, father and mother. He may not mean physical, it may mean the spiritual body of Christ and hospitality. But he tells Peter, you will receive back with persecutions, by the way, and then eternal life in the age to come, but those who are first will be last and the last first. I love the statement, we've left everything and followed you. What does it mean to be a Christian? It doesn't mean just being here one hour a week. That's not what a Christian makes, is it? it, it that may make that, in the sense of a football fan, that may be a fan. But in, in the sense of a Christian, is that a devoted disciple of Christ? Peter says, we've left everything. What does it mean to be a Christian? Luke 9, 23, Jesus makes this statement. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Deny himself. That's something we need more. We need more self-denial. We need more self, that's enough for you, turn it off. More self-denial. But the, the key thing I want us to, to hone in on here is this is a daily thing. This is a, the word disciple means follower of Christ, and it's not a one, one out of seven day follower, is it? You know, one hour out of a week's worth of hour follower. It's a daily. How do I follow Jesus tomorrow and be a devoted disciple of Christ? How do I follow him on Tuesday? How do I follow him on Wednesday? I remember being at a, a funeral <clears throat> a, a while back and uh, preached a funeral. And one of the songs in this funeral toward the end of it, and I remember kind of standing there and listening to it. And the song was, I did it my way. And the longer I stand there and let, and I know the family didn't mean any harm by that. And, and there's a, there's an appropriate sense of that. But the longer I stood there and listened to it, I thought, boy, that's, that's not good. That's, that's not good because there's so much in us that says, I want it my way. And as Americans, we have, we, you can't go to the grocery store and, and just about and find something very quickly because you have too many choices. We have too many choices. We are hardwired in our society to have it our way. And God says, you have to deny yourself daily and follow me. To be a true devoted disciple. Um, Luke 9, 57. Reading on in this passage. Uh, there, were, there were people that came to Jesus and they said, I'll follow you, Jesus. And, and Jesus says, you don't understand. The, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Someone else says, I'll come follow you. And, but first, let me go do this. Jesus answered that man. He talked about burying his father. He says, let, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you... I not really noticed that before. It, in this part, and there are three disciples that try to come to Jesus and say, I'll follow you, and Jesus, but they have an excuse. They can't do it quite yet, or they have a caveat, or, uh, you know, I'll do it, Jesus, but here's an asterisk. And Jesus says, no, forget all that. You, you're either all in or you're out. And in the midst of that passage with this man, Jesus says, as for you. 
And I think that's, that's so appropriate because the rich young ruler that came to Jesus, Jesus told him to sell everything. He hasn't told all of us to sell everything. But he did that man. He was testing him. With this man, he had an answer. He says, I want you to go proclaim the word of God as for you. So I stop and I think, and I would ask you to think, what would Jesus say to you? What do you think he is drawing you to do? What is he saying? As for you, here's what I need from you. Here's what I want from you. I'll give you a few examples. And uh, uh, this is exciting to me. But, you know, just with the, our trunk or treat this week, we had different ones doing different things. Uh, a, a number of you did trunks, and that's the whole, of course, that's the whole point of it. But others, you, you helped in one way or another. You, everyone participated, or, or all those that did, you had a role, and every role was important. Down to, we had one, I'm, I'm not going to name these, and partly because um, some people that serve humbly and in real humbly way, humble ways uh, really wish to not be named. But we had an individual come during the day and serve setting up and doing the, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Came up and spent some time during the day of Trunk or Treat helping set up. And there was another individual that at the end of the night, one of, the, one of the things they did is at the end of the night when everyone's packing up and leaving, they are helping shut down, helping clean up. It, it's, a, it's a menial thing. It's simple, but it's service. As for you, what is Jesus saying? Here's what I could use you for, right? We had ladies at a funeral meal yesterday um, come and serve, and, and serve a meal to a hurting family who's lost a loved one. And at those funeral meals, that's what they do. I love, and it, I, I love seeing those disciples, those ladies. That's what God needs them doing. What does God need you doing? What about you? Um, let's transition to John. Turn to John 3. There's a disciple that comes to Jesus. He wants to... He, this is Nicodemus. He wants to follow Christ. He wants to. Jesus tells him, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. And, and Nicodemus is struggling with this. And in verse 7, Jesus says, don't marvel... Don't marvel that I say you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. What's the point of that? Jesus is saying the, the wind, you, you, we don't see wind, but we see the effects of the wind. We feel wind. Okay, the wind comes. Where'd the wind come from? I mean, it's all over this planet. I, we don't understand that. And we have an understanding of our planet, unlike they did 2,000 years ago. We don't understand where wind comes from, and we don't quite get where it goes. And yet we we're okay with wind. And Jesus is saying, you're not going to understand everything about the Spirit. You're not going to understand everything about God. And look at what Nicodemus says. Nicodemus, by the way, and some of you are this way. You're thinkers. Um... You ponder, you think deeply, and you question. And to question is okay, as long as you don't stumble to the point of losing faith because you can't understand it all. But look at what Nicodemus said. How can these things be? Nicodemus says, I don't understand. Jesus is, uh, Jesus is saying, I know you don't understand. That's okay. You don't understand it all. And then in verse 12, Nicodemus still struggles. Verse 12, Jesus says, If I told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? <clears throat> Sometimes people, they want to follow Christ, but they stumble and they hit a roadblock. And the roadblock is, why didn't God heal my sick mother? Or the roadblock is, how can God be eternal? Or the road, you know, it's some other roadblock of how can a good God allow bad things to happen? It's some mental hang up. They don't get it. They, they can't comprehend it. They cannot make it make sense. And my point to you is to be a devoted disciple, one of our obstacles may be intellectual. And the answer is you're not going to understand it all. And that's where we step out in faith and say, God, I trust you. I have questions. I don't get it. 
And by the way, if we could understand it all, how could, how could a God so higher than us be of such that the created could fully fathom the Creator? We're not going to, and we have to trust and overcome that. In Matthew 28, 18, this is where, you know, we know this passage where Jesus calls, He tells His disciples to go out and He tells them to preach this message. Here's what He wants them to do. Go make disciples. And I wonder, it, you know, in the church, I've, uh, the term I normally use is Christian to talk about us. And our mission is to make more Christians, right? We want people to be saved and go to heaven. That's, that's the main thing. And I, I use the word Christian and I think of the word Christian and it's appropriate, but the word disciple is one that we need to think more about. Am I a, have I just signed up to be on God's team or am I following God Monday? Am I following God Tuesday? Am I following God Wednesday? Am I a disciple? And so I've, I've seen this, maybe you've seen this recently, be a comparison. And so I want to compare members and disciples. The word member is not a bad word, okay? There's, that word in and of itself is not bad, but I, will, I do want to use it to contrast. Basically, this is a fan and a disciple is a devoted fan. A, a member is someone who's, yeah, I'm on God's team. I believe in God and I'll, I'll be here periodically with the, with the team. But a disciple is a follower. I'm all in. And that's what today's sermon is about. Are you all in? And so to contrast those, members go to church. Disciples are the church. Members go to a worship service. Disciples go to a service and worship. Members know doctrines and rituals. Disciples, they know God. And that, there, there's a difference there. Members, they have a religion about Jesus. Disciples, they have a relationship with Jesus. Members believe in going to church. Disciples invite others to come to worship. Members confess that they make mistakes. Disciples confess their sins. Members pray for what they want. Disciples pray for, God, for what God wants. It's not wrong to pray for what you want and need. But, but a follower of Christ says, and Jesus did it in, in the Lord's Prayer, He said, Your will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. Members know about Jesus. Disciples follow Jesus. Members listen to and critique sermons. Disciples are living sermons. And then the, probably the most powerful uh, scripture I know on this topic for us is Luke 14, 25. Jesus had great crowds around Him. It's kind of strange. Jesus didn't, you know, Jesus could have built a larger following. He wasn't just about numbers. Because in his massive numbers, Jesus will make a statement that almost runs off a bunch of them. And he does it here. It's, he turned and said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. It, the message is clear. With God, you're either all in or, or, or you're out. It's an all or nothing. It, it's not a, uh, you know, one statement I want to say is, God is not calling part-time disciples. He's not calling part-time disciples. He doesn't want some who are, He doesn't want just, if you're interested, just come and hang out, you know, for a while. We have a statement sometimes, we don't care why you come, but we care why you stay. Come as you are, but don't stay that way. Become a fully devoted disciple. Surrender your life to Christ. All in. And then this verse, verse 33. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now to the American, to the average American, hold on a minute. I got some things. I kind of like them. And Jesus says, if you don't renounce it all, the word renounce means to give up your right. 
And what that means is if you have a nice house and you like your house, it doesn't mean go sell it today. What it means is if God required it, if God needed it, if you knew that God needed that more than you needed that, is it, does your house belong to God or does it belong to you? Does your car belong to God? Does it belong to you? Your money, does your time belong to God? Do you feel like you're giving God your time or is it His time? Did you surrender that at the cross when you were baptized? It's God's time, isn't it? It's, it's, everything is God's. And that's what it means to renounce. And we need to do that. Um, I want to close with, some of you have heard me tell this before, but I have uh, so much gratitude for my grandfather, my dad's dad, who's passed away now. But my dad's dad, when he became a Christian, the circumstances were like this. My grandmother had, uh, she was already a Christian, and they would attend some, but not, they weren't really fully uh, as a family. And then my grandfather was invited to a gospel meeting, and he went. And a few nights into that, he decided he's either got to go forward and, and, and become a Christian, have his sins washed away, or get out. And so he did. He became a Christian. And when he did, this part was a little surprising, I think, because you, you don't know. But they didn't just start going Sunday mornings one hour a week. But the family went all the time. If the church met Sunday night, they went Sunday night. If the church met for a gospel meeting, they went. If they met Wednesday night, they went. And the reason is, and he made the statement, if, we're gonna, if I'm going to do this, I'm going all the way. I'm not, going to do, I'm not going to be halfway about this. And I, and I love that lineage because that's, I think, has a power, had a powerful impact on my father becoming a minister. Regardless, had he chosen that profession or not, I'm convinced that mom and dad would have had us with the church every opportunity. And that was instilled in me, and I'm try, we're trying to instill it in my children. But it's an attitude, church. Am I all in or am I part-time about this? We're going to sing a song of encouragement. The song is, All to Jesus I Surrender. I would imagine there's something in your life that the devil has you clinging to. And whatever that is, what does it gain you if you have that and you go to eternal destruction with that? Why not release it? Let a loving God take over your life. Be a truly devoted disciple. If there's any this morning, maybe you have a prayer you want us to pray uh, with you about. Maybe there's one this morning you've never surrendered your life to Christ. Never had your sins washed away. We would love nothing more than to stop and help someone do that this morning. If you would come while we stand and sing. All to Jesus I surrender all. To Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, Please be seated.